all. So at this time we are recording. I have the privilege to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. First, we have Christy Overbeck, pronouns she, her, hers. Christy has been an advocate since 2008. She is a nationally credentialed advocate with the designation as a comprehensive victim services specialist in domestic and sexual violence and campus advocacy. With a client-centered focus, she is particularly experienced with high-risk relationship abuse, strangulation and stalking cases, LGBTQ plus relationship dynamics, as well as injunction preparation. Christy feels it is her life calling to ensure that every one of our clients is treated with dignity and respect, informed of their options and given the best opportunities for success. No one should feel like they must go through trauma and victimization alone. We're here to help 24 seven. Christy is all about comfort and she is always available for warm hugs and snack times. She is a UCF alumni and a UCF graduate student. Outside the office, Christy enjoys adventures with her sons and husband, trips to New Orleans, and all things Marvel, DC, and Middle Earth. Welcome, Christy. Our next panelist is Rosa Abraham. Pronouns she, her, hers, Aya. Rosa Abraham is a bilingual crisis counselor and victim advocate at BSC. With a master's degree in counseling psychology attained in Puerto Rico, she is currently pursuing a PhD in forensic psychology in the quest of developing further tools in the field of victimology. She has been consulted as an expert witness and worked with high risk populations for approximately six years. In the community, Rosa actively engages as a member of the Florida Crisis Response Team and other community task force in Central Florida to advocate for individuals healing from trauma. We also have Michelle Brooks. Pronouns she, her, hers. <laughs> She's waving to y'all. Michelle Brooks is the Director of Employee Relations and HR Compliance with the University of Central Florida. With over a decade of growing up in the tourism industry, Michelle found herself landing an opportunity with UCF's Human Resources Department. Fast forward short of two decades, Michelle has led the Employee Relations section of UCF HR regarding non-faculty personnel matters. Her primary responsibilities include educating staff on their rights and responsibilities in accordance with promoting compliance with applicable collective bargaining agreements, university personnel regulations and policies, and best business practices. She approaches her work with a caring demeanor for the campus community. She strongly believes that being genuine and respecting and appreciating others is the key to success in coaching, motivating, and encouraging open communication with employees. She attributes her personal, her professional growth for having a willingness to learn from others, importance of humor, and the timing of such, and the many conversations she has had with employees that consistently express their dedication to the university, regardless of the current dilemma at hand. Michelle earned her Bachelor's of Arts in Organizational Behavior from Rollins College. She also considers herself a UCF Knight because she's married to one and is SHRM and HRCI certified human resources professional. Welcome, Michelle. Our final panelist is Charlie Piper, pronouns she, her, hers. Charlie Piper has been employed at UCF since 2003. Her current position is in the Provost Academic Affairs Division as a director for contract compliance and administrator support. For the last 15 years or so, she has been working with grievances, discipline, collective bargaining, and many other faculty related issues. The office also provides administrators assistance with faculty concerns. Thank you all for being with us today. Please feel free to say hello and greet your audience. Hi everyone. Hello. So hey there, welcome. We've compiled a group of questions to have our panelists answer that we hear often about domestic abuse. Our goal for this Q&A is to start a greater conversation on the topic and raise awareness on such an important issue. So let's begin. To start off, our victim advocate, Christy, can you give us a definition for domestic abuse? 
Of course, Jess. Domestic abuse is a pattern of coercive, controlling behavior that's pervasive, sometimes life-threatening, and is considered a crime if reported to police. It's affecting people in our communities, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, religion, social standing, and immigration status. Domestic abuse is a lot more than just acts of physical violence. It takes many forms, physical, emotional, economic, sexual, and also includes stalking and harassment. Abuse is not love. It's one person in a relationship having power and control over another person. It can also be a predator sensing vulnerability, taking advantage of someone's prior victimization and using that against them in a new relationship. It's never a victim's fault if they're re-victimized, especially if they grew up in a home where abuse was normal. Thank you so much, Christy, for giving us that definition. Christy, could you also let us know how one could tell if abuse is present in their relationship? Okay, Jess. Um, well, there are five areas where abuse, um, for abuse that we can look at. The most talked about characteristic of domestic abuse is the physical aspect, you know, which includes the scratching, the biting, the shoving, the slapping, the punching. You know, it can also be throwing objects to hurt or intimidate the person destroying possessions or treasured objects, hurting or threatening to hurt your children or pets, disrupting your sleep patterns to make you feel exhausted. Physical abuse doesn't always leave marks or cause permanent damage. There's also emotional and psychological abuse. Emotional and psychological abuse are behaviors your partner uses to control, to control you or damage your emotional well-being. It can be verbal or nonverbal. That can be include name calling, manipulating your children, telling what you can do and can't do, um, placing little value on your words or twisting them, putting you down in front of others, accusing you of cheating or they're being overly jealous, monitoring your phone calls, your texts, your car, your computer usage. They also shift responsibility for their abusive behavior by blaming others or say you caused it. Then there's economic and financial abuse. Um, economic and financial abuse happens when the abuser's actions impact the victim, the victim's ability to make or control their own money or makes a victim entirely financially dependent on the abuser with no power or say in the relationships. Abusers um, can also sabotage employment opportunities by giving the victim a black eye or other physical injury prior to an important meeting or an interview, by jeopardizing employment, by stalking or harassing the victim in the workplace, denying access to a, um, a vehicle or damage the vehicle so the victim can't get to work. There's also sabotaging educational opportunities by destroying class assignments or computers. You know, denying access to bank accounts, running up debt in the victim's name is also one we've seen. Um, there's stalking and harassment. Stalking and harassment can happen in relationships where the abusive partner or ex-partner demands your time even after you make it clear you don't want contact with them. They can make unwanted visits or sending you unwanted messages, overwhelming your voicemail, your text, um, your emails following you, including in installing GPS tracking software on your car or your cell phone without your knowledge or consent. There's also embarrassing you in public or refusing to leave when asked, which may involve police causing further complications at work or school. And lastly, there's sexual abuse. This is when um, abusers pressure or force you to participate in unwanted sex acts. There are so many other things that can happen in, abusive relationship, in an abusive situation. Um, if you're experiencing any of these signs or have questions, um, please reach out to an advocate um, by calling our confidential hotline. We're happy to talk through your specific situation. Thanks for breaking that down, Christy. It, it definitely helps to hear all the different ways someone might experience it. Because um, I think you're right, physical definitely comes first for a lot of people, but the humiliation, the sabotaging, mm -hmm. Uh, those are all really important things that you brought up, so thank you. Next, our, our next question will be for our crisis counselor, Rosa. Is it possible for an abusive partner to change? Hi, Jessica and everyone. Um, that's quite a, a definitive question, so <laughs> there's no yes or no uh, answer for this one. What I can say is that if we assess this situation uh, evidence-based and psychologically, there are treatment approaches in psychology that are specifically tailored for working with what can be identified as a perpetrator, an aggressor, or a person who is engaging in abusive behavior. 
Um, additionally, if we go to the criminal justice system, there is models that intend to offer some kind of rehabilitation uh, attempts for people who are engaged in a legal abuser uh, crime. There could be batterers programs, restorative justice programs, um, domestic violence classes and workshops. So it depends on the kind of history that this person may have on the patterns of the perpetrating behavior, on what kind of danger could it represent to the society, but also people or themselves. So that's why it's so important for people who are experiencing a situation like Christy was describing to come up to professionals so we can assess the situation and guide in a preventive manner. Um, as a behavioral science professional, I believe that everybody has the capacity to um, learn and rehabilitate. However, we cannot generalize. So there's more complex sides of the spectrum with um, mental health disorders that even though we may have a perception or the intention to help this person, it can only be done through uh, specialized teams. So please don't take the role of trying to fix this person or help this person as a partner. Let's try to reach out and identify those risk factors. Thank you, Rosa. So it does sound like there are programs out there specialized for treatment with somebody that you said could be an, an aggressor and an abuser, um, but they, like you said, they're professionals in that field where there are services for the survivors to reach out to for assistance. And it's very particular based on the complexity of having the legal system involved. So that's why uh, it's highly structured and it's recommended that these individuals go through the process guided. Right, thank you so much for that. Um, we also have a question for you regarding LGBTQ plus relationships. Um, can you talk a little bit about what they might experience as far as domestic abuse? Yes. So um, the community uh, in general experiences high levels of violence, right? We see it on TV, we see it in the news, social media. However, the LGBT community plus individuals, they experience a higher level. So if we go back to the statistics, we're going to see reports that the incidence of them being a victim of sexual abuse, domestic violence, in, intimate partner violence, is always above the average for maybe conventional or heterosexual relationships. So it's important for us to consider that there might be some specificity on certain things um, as of the community. It could be discrimination, it could be targeting their identity, it could be um, targeting their self-esteem. So what I've come to see by experience is that rather than physical for this community, it's more emotional. And it's more about how um, their values or their identity is questioned consistently and how they're may be dependent on their partner to have better choices or better opportunities in the community. So I would say that the risk factors may be highly similar. The manifestations may be different. And once again, I, I stand away from generalization, but we're always wanting to see um, if we see a disbalanced relationship, if we see that someone, for example, is always um, questioning the partner prior to making decisions, maybe like a in a fast food or in a social gathering, if we see that they're constantly looking for approval on social media from their partner or some patterns that become repetitive, those may be specific um, indicators that something may be leading to intimate partner violence. Thank you, Rosa. So next we're gonna be speaking with our human resources panelists, Michelle and Charlie. Could you talk about the staff and faculty side if UCF is notified of abuse and employees experiencing? Um, Michelle, would you start for us? Sure, no problem. Thank you. If when we have these situations that do occur and they bring this matter to our attention, what we like to initially do, thankfully, is connect them immediately with victim services and an advocate. 
to help them walk through what could be different options and next steps available to them and working through a very sensitive and what can sometimes be a very hurtful and embarrassing topic for them to even bring to the attention of human resources. And so we want to remind them that what they bring forward is confidential and that they can get assistance through victim services. And then another wonderful resource is our employee assistance program. And so if it's okay, I, I can talk briefly about the employee assistance program as well. Please do. Okay. The employee assistance program that we have at the University of Central Florida is a wonderful, confidential, and free benefit to all of our employees. And it's the opportunity to work with an individual, perhaps with a domestic situation, to work with a counselor on how do, how do I work through this process? What, what is it that I can do? How do I recover? How can I get assistance? And, and what I think is wonderful about this support is that that support is a process. So it's not anything that would just occur within one meeting, but it, it's a wonderful process. And our EAP is able to connect our employees with a with a provider within the area that they live. And so that if at some point they need to go beyond six free sessions, which I just want to um, definitely take a moment to talk about, it is six free sessions, which is great and unheard of with an employee assistance program. But you can continue those sessions through your health insurance for our employees. And so they'll make sure from the onset to hook you up with a individual counselor, therapist, whatever type of support that you do need that is covered under your health insurance. So you can continue those services beyond the six free sessions. And it's also available for any members of your household. And so if you have children, for example, um, or other family members in the household, it would cover those individuals as well. Thank you, Michelle. Wow. So that, that's some great information. So it sounds like from the staff side, um, you really all support getting victim services involved to have them speak with an advocate if it comes to the intention, the attention of the employer that there's some sort of abuse. And then it sounds like the employee assistance program is a great resource for them to be able to utilize in addition um, for support services. Yeah. Charlie, anything from the faculty side that you'd like to add as far as the workplace being notified of any abuse or the employee assistance program? Thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, <laughs> if I could just say ditto, that was you know, an excellent way of making sure that if people recognize themselves in any aspects of what Christy was talking about in, in the um, various kinds of abuse that isn't necessarily a, a physical action, but we want to work on a plan to get you safe, your children, your pets, your finances, all those things. Victim services is definitely the best place to start to help you get wrap your head around a plan and, a, and a, also a way to approach your supervisor. I think that's probably a very difficult step to take. Um, when I read this question, what could I expect? I think you can basically expect that UCF should, will, at least in my, my experience, will take this very seriously. We, we want to get you to the right resources and get you a person to help document and get you in a, to a safe place. That's our first step. And then all the other little steps along the way. So yes, there's there's EAP, which is which is a wonderful resource as you're working on healing. We also, I think, Michelle, if you wanted to talk a little bit about FMLA, if that becomes important. Absolutely, thank you, Charlie. So FMLA is the Family Medical Leave Act that will allow you to be out for a period of time per federal guidelines for any sort of medical condition that may 
interfere with your ability to continue to work and do the essential functions of your job. And so it, what, what I find interesting is over my years, and, and Charlie and I both have been here since like 2003, um, it's interesting because our employees will automatically think I have to be incapacitated physically somehow, some way. And that's not necessarily the case. You can obviously have some mental impairment for an ability or, or um, some mental health challenges that you're trying to deal with and undertake. And FMLA is available for that as well. So what I, I guess I wanted to get across, and thank you, Michelle, that's definitely exactly precisely what I was looking for, is, is to know that there's there's like financial support in a sense. So you can you, you can be able to step away and that help with the communication with your supervisor and all those things. So that's what UCF is, is weaving together a bunch of different resources together to help you. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, Michelle, for, I love what you said there, Charlie, about UCF um, wants you all to know that this is a serious thing that they take in consideration and they want you to be safe um, and bringing up FMLA as another type of support that an employee can can utilize, I think it's very important to bring up. So thank you both for that. So next question we have is going to be for Rosa with the Victim Service Center. Can you explain how abuse might affect the children and the pets in the family? Sure. So I like to think about children and pets as being in a in a particular space in a domestic violence situation because children do not codify the world as we do as adults. So it's important for us to understand that maybe a reaction from an adult or words or certain uh, scenarios that may be occurring around them, they're giving them their own meaning if they don't have an explanation for it. So it's important to consider that when we are talking about us trying to create a safety plan for a children, we also have to consider how they may re be reacting to this experience. So some of the experiences that could happen is that they become reactive to what we know common reactions to trauma, which could be isolation, poor concentration in school. Um, 